Okay, so I guess our first question here with Dr. Stevenson, uh, I can sort of kick us off. If you could tell us uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? Yeah, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, grew up there, went to high school, went to the West Philadelphia High School, graduated in 1970. And then after graduation, I went to uh, Penn State University, which is up in the middle of the state, exit number 25 off the turnpike. Uh, stayed there for a year. Um, it was during the the Black Campus Movement, and we were starting to uh, challenge universities, PWIs, to allow Black students up there. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with State College, but State College uh, was a sundown town. And so uh, for the most part, uh, after sundown, Black people really were kind of skeptical about going down down downtown. So I left, went to Lincoln University, uh, which is in Pennsylvania. It's an HBCU. It's about an hour and a half from where I grew up. Um, after after Lincoln, I, I moved to California and I went to seminary and I pastored for 30 years. I have uh, two master's degrees in biblical studies and theology, one in theological research methods and a doctorate degree in church history. And I also have a PhD from Michigan State. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, actually, before I get to the next question, can you sort of tell us a little bit more about um, your experience in in your neighborhood and in your um, schools, uh, grade school, middle school, high school, um, with discrimination? Were you discriminated against at any point in your life? And so, if so, like, can you sort of recall any particular examples that you could talk about? Um, yeah. So I went to a predominantly black uh, elementary school, junior high school, high school. There were two white people in my high school, uh, 1,200 people in my graduating class. Uh, when I was in junior high school, I, I knew when I, was, uh, when I was about eight years old that I wanted to be a teacher. It was just something about books that I enjoyed. My mother started buying me encyclopedias. They used to have a guy that, walk, that would come to your, your house once a week with these books. And my mother started buying me the encyclopedias alphabetically. And, and so I read them all. And when I was in junior high school, about to go to high school, uh, the counselor asked me, what did I want to do when I grew up? And I told her I wanted to be a, a teacher. And she said, well, my father, my father only had a fifth grade education. He had to uh, drop out of school. He was born in 1927. My mother just barely made it out of high school. So, so no one in my family had ever gone to college. And so the counselor said, you know, based on that background, I shouldn't consider college. So I went home and told my mother, you know, the counselor said, you know, and this is what she said. You people don't do well in college. You should get a trade. And so I said, mom, you know, maybe I shouldn't be a teacher. I should get a trade. Well, mama wasn't having that. She was a civil rights activist. And uh, uh, matter of fact, I was telling someone this recently, I met Malcolm X when I was about nine years old because of her involvement in civil rights and the civil rights movement in Philadelphia. And so he's always been fascinating me. I always grew up, as I grew up, I, 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 I imagined myself doing some of the kinds of things that he did for the community. Uh, so uh, this woman said I wasn't smart enough. My mother wasn't having it. She went to the school, wanted to burn the school down. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little upset. Uh, the principal had to really restrain my mother from killing this counselor who told me I wasn't smart enough to go to college. And uh, I ended up going and my uh, I was the, the first in my family to go to college to have a brother who's in osteopathic medicine. He does total knee and hip replacement. I have a sister who has a doctorate in theology. And so I kind of laid the groundwork for uh, the rest of my siblings to to attend, to, to attend college. Um, hey, Dr. Stevenson, I'm Ahmad Sanchez. Um, hey. Sorry to introduce myself earlier. Uh, so did you get any support from the school when you applied to colleges? I did. In those days, they were in the, in the, in the late 60s, between 68 through about 74, PWIs were trying to get Black students in college. That's one of the reasons the Pell Grant came into existence. And so the state colleges received a lot of money for bringing minority students in. As a matter of fact, uh, at Penn State, uh, before 1968, 
you could not, if you were coming from an inner city university school, you could not go directly from high school to state college. You had to go to a satellite uh, campus like Delaware or they had them in Pennsylvania, um, York, Pennsylvania, and then you would do two years there. And if you survived that, then you could go to state college and finish your last two years. Uh, but my class was one of the first classes where they allowed us to come straight from our high schools to state college. Um, and, 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 and it kind of proved their theory because out of about 30, 350 students in my class who came in in 1970, about 55, 60% flunked out the first semester, second semester, because we weren't, we weren't, we weren't prepared for it. You know, our, oftentimes our high schools did not prepare us for the rigor uh, of a Penn State University. So uh, th that made sense, but it was also very, very racist. You figure out of, out of, out of 36,000 students um, at that time, and Penn State is much bigger than that now, uh, only maybe 2% were people of color. Um, so my follow-up question would be, um, can you talk about the process of filling out the college application and like applying and all that? Okay, I'm 68 years old. I've been out of college longer than some of you. <laughs> uh, it was rather extensive though. I remember um, having to, my, my parents had to find all kind of W-2 forms and tax, tax forms and all that kind of stuff, uh, which in, in a lot of black houses we didn't have. We didn't have all that information. Are really available uh, for us, but uh, the college application is rather extensive. In fact, even applying here, the the application for professorship here is just amazing. You know, the, the, the amount of paperwork that goes into it can be very very daunting. You know, uh, but I don't remember all of it. I just know there was a lot of work that my my mother and father had to do that I wasn't familiar with. But we had a there was a guy. His name was Bubbles. He's the one that took me up to Penn State. He helped my parents fill out the paperwork. So that's kind of how it worked. Yeah, would, do you recall there uh, being someone in your high school who kind of motivated you to go to go on to college? No. Played the role of a mentor in any way? No, no. I went to college uh, because it was something I felt I was called to do. Uh, there was no one else in my family who had gone. And uh, in those days, you had two tracks. You had a college track. Uh, and then you had a business track. Oh, and then you had a trade track. Uh, and so the college prep prepared you for it, but there really wasn't a lot of people who were saying, hey man, you should go here and do this. They, you know, it's, it, was very, it was rather perfunctory as opposed to you know, just really uh, investing in us to make sure that we were able to be successful at the college level. Um, okay, so going to college, going to Penn State, can you tell us about your experience there? Like you were talking about, um, you were mentioning at the beginning of the interview. Can you like elaborate? Yeah, it was it was culture shock. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd never been around that many white people at one time. Uh, I lived in a dormitory area. I lived in North Halls where I was a phys ed major. So most of the athletes, a lot of the athletes, the phys ed majors lived up there. If you know anything about Penn State, it is athletic capital uh, from basketball to football to baseball to uh, tennis, gymnastics. And I was one of very few African-Americans who lived in that dorm area. Um, and for the most part, I mean, we're talking 70. America was still very racist. Um, it was uh, very covert racism. Uh, we were very clear that professors didn't want us in, our, in the class. I know, I remember one incident, I was, I was taking Sociology 101, and I, I, I just wasn't getting the concept. It was the first time I'd ever been in a classroom where there were 250 people um, uh, up on the like a, a, a balcony kind of stairs. And they, it was the first time I'd ever seen a, a blackboard that had a black light. So you, when he wrote on the board, you could see it like a black light kind of uh, uh, chalk. Um, I'd never seen that before, but I'd never been to classroom that bit. And so when I made an appointment to see the professor, he was rather condescending and not very helpful. 
And I didn't do well in the class. And uh, it was another one of the reasons why I felt that Penn State wasn't the place for me. Because I, I don't think, I think that, um, and it still happens today, uh, that there is a sense in which one's uh, ethnic uh, and ethnicity uh, uh, makes a suggestion about the intellect. And for the most part, uh, uh, black people were not thought to be capable of being successful at, at the college level. And so you, you, we got that not only in the, in the community there, but also primarily uh, in the classroom. Just to kind of follow up on Omar's question, do you recall any specific examples of, of experiences of prejudice in college that you faced? Um, apart from the college professor you mentioned, um, anything that you recall that you could add? Just being um, anxious about being downtown at night. You know, no. Do you know what the sun downtown is? Yes, but please. Okay. Yeah, I the don't. Sun downtown. Okay. There's you. You heard of David? You heard of James Lowen? He wrote the lies my teacher told me. Well, he also wrote a book called Sun Downtowns. A sun down. A sun downtown was predominantly a white town or city, but primarily a town where black people were not allowed to be in the city or downtown after the sundown went down. So when it started getting dark, we were supposed to be off the streets in our homes or whatever. And even though we did traffic back and forth, there was a sense in which uh, we were not wanted. You know, there were the bars, we, the restaurants, uh, many of the stores were uh, 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 very um, abrasive when you came in at night, especially during the evening. And so um, that was pretty much my experience at Penn State for, for, the, first, for the first year, that just, just this anxiety of not feeling confident if I was downtown. I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, in West Philadelphia, which is black. I, I, grew up, I grew up nine blocks from the University of Pennsylvania. I could actually walk from U of P to my house. Uh, and within that walk, you would walk through maybe three or four different neighborhoods. But the neighborhood I lived in, uh, initially, we were, we were the first black family to move into my neighborhood. But by the time I got to high school, it was predominantly African-American. Um, so can you talk about the transition from Penn State to, you said, Lincoln University? Oh, God, yeah. Uh, the first thing were, was the majority of the professors were African-American. Secondly, the professors saw us as a legacy or an inheritance as opposed to a threat. They, they recognized how difficult it was to be Black and in academia. And so... And so they worked us harder, but they knew that the results at the end would pay off. The, the, the office hours were different. Uh, we didn't only meet in the office, but sometimes they would meet in the cafeteria. Uh, sometimes just walking across campus with one of the professors was, was something that you know, raised your expectations and your, your desire to be successful. But then it's the social life. I pledged a fraternity. I pledged a fraternity at Penn State. And then when I got to Lincoln, um, uh, my fraternity had a chapter there. It's the same university that Thurgood Marshall graduated from. He's also a member of my fraternity. Uh, and so, you know, these kinds of things uh, change the way I even understand academia because I felt like I fit in. Um, can you talk about the, what is, how, can you talk about the importance of having um, Black faculty and minoritized faculty teaching like a student, like a black student or a student of color? Absolutely. First of all, um, if you don't see it, you can't be it. And oftentimes the assumption is in America, especially because of the way the media functions, that the only thing that black people do is play sports and entertain white people. 
And I, I'm convinced that I don't know if you're familiar with um, there's a book. Uh, can you hold one second? This book right here by Nathan Norman. Right. Um, 892 pages. Norman's African-American. And one of the most important things I think he says in this book is that white students learn and need to learn from black professors as well as black professors, uh, black students. And that is because there is an assessment and an assumption that black people can't teach white people anything. Now, I'll tell you how that segues. When I was in seminary, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary uh, in Pasadena. Um, after I started my second master's degree, which is a TM, which is an advanced master's degree, I was invited to become the assistant director of African-American ministries at the school and to teach there. And so I taught an introduction to research methods at that university. I had a white student who wrote a paper, wasn't that bad, he got a B plus, and he goes to the dean and he tells the dean he should have got a better grade. So I go to the dean with him, uh, they, the dean calls a meeting, we're sitting in this meeting, and this guy says to me, the professor, my dad told me that a black man can't teach me anything anyway. He didn't use black man, he used a different word. But the point is, there is this assumption that black people can't teach white people anything. And so it is very important um, that we have black professors um, uh, in, in, in the colleges and the universities because we do not only do, not only do we bring a, diff, a different dynamic to the way we teach, but we bring a different dynamic in how we teach because the African culture is very relational, whereas the Caucasian may not be. And it's very important to understand that education from an Afrocentric perspective is always about the community. It's never about the, the teacher. It's always about the ability to raise your students to the next level. If you if you get a chance, if you were able to look at my um, my teaching evaluation since I've been here at UF, and the majority of my students are white, most of them will say something like, Dr. Stevenson made me feel like I belong in the classroom. I understood that what he was saying to me was not just information for the class, but information for life. Those are, those are two different approaches, right? And that is because of the way that we are contextualized as African-Americans, but also it's because as a culture, we recognize that growth is not about information. It's about growth in relationship to the person you're talking to. You follow me? That my goal is not just to give my students information to pass my class, I want them to pass light because ultimately we're going to be in relationship one way or another. And that's the most significant difference, I think, that people of color bring to the classroom. Oh, thank you for that answer. Um, uh, the next sort of related question is um, in your um, time in college, did you come across um, any um, white professors, white uh, 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 clerical staff who sort of made a positive impression on you, uh, helped you in any way, uh, develop your sense of academia, or what it means to be a student uh, in college? Not in college, but in graduate school. Shall I elaborate? Yes, please. Okay. So I need to set the I need to set the context. I meant, again I mentioned that my dad was born in 1927. So he grew up in the South. He was familiar with black codes, black men not looking white women in the face, stepping off the sidewalk, Emmett Till, et cetera. I was born in 1952. Emmett Hill was was murdered in 1955. So my dad cautioned me about not only being in relationships with white women, but being careful about being seen with them by themselves. And so all throughout my undergraduate career and all the way up until my second year of graduate school, I didn't, I didn't even want to be on the same side of the street with a white woman. So when I was in seminary, I read this paper that I wrote. Uh, it was entitled, uh, The Role of Racism in Theology. 
and the problems with integration in America. And I argue that integration is one of the worst things that ever happened to black people. You know, I think about Black Wall Street, you know what I'm talking about. So this young lady heard me read this paper. She invited me to consider being uh, on, on the cabinet of the student government. And I said to her, no, I really don't like being in that close proximity with white women. And so I turned it down. And then I began to think about it. And I really felt like the Lord was saying to me that that was not a correct response, being a man, a Christian as I was. So I went back to her and I apologized. And I said, if that, if that position is still open, I'm willing to take it. Well, she introduced me to a woman by the name of Dr. Ruth Tucker, who was a church historian. Uh, she was a visiting professor at Fuller, and I took her class on African-American church history. Literally changed my life. The reason I became a church historian is because of her. Um, when I moved to Michigan and I began pastoring the church there, she came to that church and spoke at my installation. The second person I met, who was a white woman, her name was Cynthia Johnson. She was a pre professor at University of Cal State Long Beach. Introduced me to Maulana Karinga. You know who Karinga is? You heard of Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa is an African celebration around Christmas. I met Karinga through Cynthia Johnson. Cynthia Johnson helped me understand how to do research methods and how to write at the college and the undergraduate school level. So these two white women who invested in my life literally changed my trajectory. And I, I could have dropped the ball and, and maintained my father's truth of the fear of white women and their ability to get a black man killed, even if he didn't do it. But that was my dad's truth. That wasn't my truth. It was still true, but it wasn't something I experienced. And I didn't have the same level of fear. And so that my, my life really began to change when I began to see that it's more important to accept individuals as individuals, as opposed to generalizing and assuming they're all the same. So these two women who happen to be white women literally changed my trajectory. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm a historian today is because of those two. As a matter of fact, uh, Ruth Tucker, uh, she's written several books, but the last, two of the last books that she wrote, she mentions me in the book, in both of her books. So would you say that she motivated you towards your career path or were Absolutely. there other, other factors that also played it, a role? It, it motivated me towards being an African-American church historian and understanding more about what the black church was. Because, because see, here, here's another thing. This is really interesting. Um, I wrote this paper on St. Augustine. You know what Augustine? St. Augustine? Okay. Uh, one of the first papers I, papers I wrote in seminary, and as, as a matter of fact, it was for her class uh, in, uh, on, on Augustine. And I always, I used to play baseball for a church in Philly called uh, St. Augustine Methodist Church. Well, all the icon, iconery in the church was white, European, Latin. Uh, but when I started doing research on Augustine, I found out that he was an African. He was not European. His mother was an African. His father was a Greek. And, 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 and the reason I drill, I began to drill down on African-American church history and, and, and African church history, because I wanted to know, for a person like Augustine, who really spent a lot of time in calculating and writing what we now believe as the Trinity, if you're Christian, and understanding those concepts, if, if he could produce that kind of document and documents, what was it about him being an African that was so shameful? And why would these, why would these church scholars constantly refer to him as a, as a, as a Latin? Why would they uh, have this I, I, iconography when he looked like he's European, when in fact, if you go to Ethiopia, or if you go to the Coptic church, the iconography is black. You, you, you get my point? And so um, I started trying to figure out 
why these black people, many of who came from Africa were Muslim, they had their own traditional religions, would accept Christianity because somebody was writing stuff that was not inaccurate. And so I spent the next, what, 30 years of my life as a black pastor and as a scholar who did research on the black church and its development in America because of those two women. They challenged me to enter a field at the time where there were very few black people with PhDs in African-American studies, church history. Thank you. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, the next question we have here is, um, what, made you, what motivated you to become employed at UF? <laughs> I lived in Michigan, and I was tired of shoveling the snow. Uh, <laughs> one, one winter, I moved there in 2001. I think it was it's either 2002 or 2003. I don't remember. It was so cold, and we had so much snow. I had to climb out of my kitchen window to walk around the front of the house to shovel the snow so I could open the garage and drive my car out. Now, like I said, I'm 68 years old. I ain't, I don't want to shovel snow anymore. I'm just, I'm done. <laughs> so, so um, in 2017, I decided it's time to go. I've been here. I, I really wanted to leave. I didn't feel like I could earlier, but I felt like I should now. And the position opened here. One, I've always wanted to live in Florida. I, I ride a motorcycle. And I'm a certified scuba diver. And some of my research I've done on slave ships right here off the Keys in Florida with NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Uh, there are some videos you might look and see me, you know, writing underwater and stuff like that, doing dimensions and working with students. And when I, I read the, the job description, one of the things that attracted me was that the program was 50 years old, but it wasn't a department. And there's only about 19 universities in the country that offer a PhD in African-American studies. And most of them are PWIs. Michigan State's one is where I got mine. And so I was a, I was, I was a part of the accreditation process at Michigan State. I watched Talent Bird and I said, hey, you know what? Um, I've got the skills. Um, this is a good opportunity. And so I applied for the position. I came down as a visiting professor and I did the first year. They offered me a second contract. I did the second year and then COVID came. Um, and there was a, a, um, what do you call, a delay in the hiring for next year, fall 2021. But I really felt like I still wanted to stay if it happened. And so they offered me a third contract. Uh, and then one of the one of my colleagues passed, Dr. Hilliard Nunn died. And I was asked to teach one of her courses, which I did. And um, then they opened up a position in, as a lecturer. And I really want to apply for the tenure track, but I haven't published enough. And so the, the lecture position opened, I applied for it. And I got a job offer two days ago. That's why I have to talk to the director today to negotiate salary and stuff like that. So um, I really felt that if the school is, and I'm one of the few people in the department now whose area is 16th, 17th, 18th century uh, African. So I do Africa as well. I, I my, my research primarily is the Middle Passage. I do research on suicide by drowning as a form of resistance. So next to epidemiology, death, death by sickness, uh, one, one of the most frequent reasons for death on a slave ship was suicide. But a lot of these Africans would cut their throats, they starve themselves, they bash their heads against the deck, but others would jump overboard. Uh, and they jumped overboard so frequently that even slave ship technology changed. They started putting nets around the, 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 the front of the ship. So when they jumped off, they would land in a, in a net. So I wanted to know why were these men and women killing themselves? Well, they believed in what they call transmigration. Ebo, the Hassan, the Fulani, the groups I studied, they believed if they died in the water, 
their spirit would go back to Africa. Right off the coast of Georgia, here's a place called Duncansville, where they have a place called Ebo's Landing, where 180 uh, Africans walked into the water after taking over slave ships, singing songs of Africa, and drowned themselves because they believed their spirit would go back to Africa. And so that's that's uh, an area that I study. There wasn't anyone, no one teaching it here uh, because the other professors were political scientists uh, um, or in media and film, uh, but none of them had a PhD in African American studies. So that's why I came. Um, something you mentioned earlier, you said you could, you felt like you couldn't leave Michigan State. Can you elaborate on, if you feel comfortable, can you elaborate on that? Not, not Michigan State University, Michigan, the city. I, I just oh. felt like, I, 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 I believe, I believe that, that my life is directly connected to how I understand God's movement. And I really felt like God wasn't telling me it's time to go. As much as I hate the cold, and everyone who knows me knows I hate the cold. Matter of fact, I just mentioned I came back from doing a five-day conference for the city of Wyoming, which is right next to Grand Rapids. If there's like adjacent to one another, uh, and the conference was supposed to be in November, but they had the COVID restrictions, and it snowed, and so when when the weather changed, they they emailed me and said, hey, man, would you consider coming back in May? And I said, as long as it doesn't snow, no doubt. So uh, I flew back there in May and did a four-day four day conference. So it's more about my spiritual understanding of where I'm supposed to be than Mi Michigan State. Okay, for sure. I was just, I was just curious. Um, sure. So I know that we're kind of pressed for time, um, but I have a question before we have to end. Is, okay. Um, how has your experience at UF been so far? You know, except for the COVID delay in my third um, contract, not bad. I mean, uh, I enjoy what I teach. My students enjoy my class there. Right now, my African-American religion class has 11 students. My Black Power class has 21 students. And, and I cross list. So it's not uncommon for my classes to have 30, 40 students in them. Um, so that has not been a bad thing. My director uh, has been very cool. Dr. Watt, uh, Dean Watt, um, who's the associate dean, she and I get along very well. And I really haven't had that many problems. I just bought a house in Ocala. I lived in Gainesville when I first moved here. Uh, and then I started house hunting because I, I knew I could save some money. I saved $100,000 by moving to Ocala. I'm 30 minutes away. People say, well, that's a long drive. Well, it's a long drive to people who live in Florida. If you live in Michigan and you drive an hour in two degree weather and the snow every day, this is a hop, skip, and a jump. So, you know, at most it's going to rain. And that and, and that is going to rain 25 minutes and then it's going to be hot. So, <laughs> you know, rain, snow, give me the rainy day of the week, right? <laughs> I have one question. Um, you're talking about your mother, who is a civil rights activist. Yes. Well, can you tell me what 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 was she involved in? I'm I'm just really curious. Oh well, once she was uh, she she was well NAACP. I joined the NAACP when I was 12, so she got me involved in that. But she all was, she was also a part of a um, a community organizing uh, organization called Citizens for Fellowship in Philadelphia. And um, she helped uh, with voting. My dad was a voting supervisor. When they had the voting um, booths in our neighborhood, my dad was one of the guys that stood outside and made sure that everything ran, ran properly. Um, my mother was very clear that if we as African-Americans were gonna be successful, it would be directly connected to our education. And so she fought for us. Um, my younger brothers and sisters, they all went to Catholic schools. I went to, uh, I'm the oldest of five, uh, but she, my mother was very clear that some of the public schools were not providing the kind of education that was necessary for them to be, be successful. Out of five of us, four of us went to college. Uh, my other brother uh, was a, my dad was a chef. And so my brother went into culinary sciences and he was a great cook. Um, 
Uh, he died about 25 years ago. But all of us are college educated because my parents were very clear that if you're going to be successful as a black person in America, remember, we're talking the 60s and 70s now. Um, not that it's not the same now, but we didn't have IT. I remember I typed my, I did my first master's degree in a typewriter. Some kids don't even know what a typewriter is, right? I, re I remember when they were saying, you know, the internet's never going to work. Well, you can't even literally out the internet now, right? So, so that's kind of how I go back. And, and so we, we, were, we were challenged uh, to be the best that we could be and to be educated. My mother always taught us that we didn't have to be the smartest person in the room. We just had to be dedicated. Because dedication pays off. I was 59 when I went back to do my PhD. I was 25 to 30 years older than most of my professors when I was doing my doctorate degree at Michigan State. Um, what motivated you to, to go uh, get your PhD, and specifically in Michigan State versus other <laughs> institutions? Well, one, it offered a PhD. Most universities don't offer a PhD. Yeah, for my friend. Two, um, well, let me go back. My first doctorate is in African-American church history. And one of the reasons I started doing it, because I wanted to try to figure out why these Africans would become Christian. I mean, everything I'd ever seen was a white Jesus with blue eyes, pie in the sky theology, you know, uh, Southern Baptists are very racist. And it didn't make sense to me that these black these people will come from Africa and then transition to a faith that was still very oppressive. If, if you've ever read slave catechisms, they wrote these things to introduce these men and women to Christianity, but not to freedom, right? One of the biggest debates that went on in the 17th, 18th century between the Baptists and the Methodists is how can we do our due diligence and disciple these slaves, but make sure they know they're still slaves, right? That's why you have this pine and thigh, pine sky theology. So I, I really started getting into slavery and the plantations. And then I read this book uh, called The Guerrero. It was a slave ship that sunk off the coast of Florida in the Keys here. And um, uh, I started getting interested in, in the Middle Passage. But I knew I couldn't teach in a secular university beyond what I was doing. I was teaching at Grand Valley State without the PhD. So I you know, enrolled in the program. I was pastoring a church. I was teaching at a seminary. I enrolled in the program at, uh, at, at Michigan State. And one of the courses I taught at the seminary in Grand Rapids, one of my students was Dr. Lee June. Well, Lee June was the chair of the psychology department at Michigan State. Black guy, African-American, he wrote on uh, Christianity and psychology in the Black family. He was one of my students. I don't think you understand what I'm saying here. Here's a guy with a PhD at Michigan State, but he was taking my church history class. When I applied for the PhD program and I saw his name, I asked him if he would be my advisor, and he did. And he, he was my advisor <laughs> through my PhD program. <laughs> Matter of fact, he, he came to my graduation, came to graduation party, hold on, he and his wife. I preached at his church. Um, so, you know, th those kinds of things would just navigate. I couldn't have, I couldn't have orchestrated that, right? Uh, and I went back because I knew there was something else that I wanted to learn, but also something else I wanted to teach, and I wasn't equipped to do it. And, you know, after reading about these, these slave ships that sank and uh, the Middle Passage, I wanted to know uh, what, what were the links, right? Uh, why were so, why out of, say, about 50 million, we, and the numbers fluctuate depending upon the sources of Africans who were extracted from the West Coast, why did so many people die at sea and why aren't we writing about it? And the thing that really kicked it off for me is when I decided I wanted to combine marine archaeology and scuba diving with Middle Passage studies, and a, and a white female professor told me, pick one or the other, that right there said to me, she doesn't know what she's talking about, because that's what I want to do. 
she was no longer on my committee and I got someone else. And that's how I ended up doing what I did. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, now, I, I want to be cognizant of your time. I know you said you you wanted to um, continue uh, what I'll, at, a, at a different date and time. So what I'll do is I'll yeah. contact you. Sure. Uh, I wish you the best today. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, again, thank you so much for your willingness to participate. And I will uh, be in touch okay. uh, to That'll set up another, another date and time that is most convenient for you. No problem. No problem. And sorry I had to cut it off, but, you know, I got to pay the mortgage. Yeah, I totally, <laughs> totally understand. Perfectly normal. Perfectly normal. <laughs> All right. All right. You, I look forward to hearing from you, man. God bless. Be safe. Thank you. Take care. Stay out of Thank trouble. <laughs>